Hey everyone, I'm Shane Hennessy, and in this video we're going to be taking a look at tablatures. While I'm going to be talking about tabs from a guitar perspective, this video will apply to any type of tablature for a fretted string instrument. So a ukulele, mandolin, a banjo, a bouzouki, anything that's got frets and strings, this video will apply to it. Tabs are easy to learn, they're easy to read, and they're a really useful way of getting information quickly. Uh, from a page onto uh, a string instrument. But I always remind people that tabs should be used in conjunction with learning by ear. They should never really just be used by themselves. You should always try to work on your ear skills with tabs as well. Tab is really useful, but it does have its limitations as well. And it can never really replace listening to the piece of music that you want to learn and watching performance videos. So first of all, what is a tab? A tablature is a method of notation for fretted string instruments that shows you which frets to play on each string as a piece of music progresses. It means that you don't need to really learn how to read from a stave or to read a chord chart in order to be able to learn a piece of music on a fretted string instrument. And a tab looks a little bit similar to a musical stave, a traditional musical stave, because it's got parallel horizontal lines. But whereas a stave always has five lines and a clef at the beginning to give you an indication as to what each line represents, a tab will change depending on the instrument that it's written for. So for example, a tab for a standard six string guitar will have six parallel uh, lines, whereas a tab for a ukulele or a mandolin will have four lines instead representing the strings or the courses of strings for those instruments. But it's always the same kind of idea when it comes to tabs in that the top line on the tab is also the top string or the highest string usually on your instrument. So when we look at a guitar tab, for example, we have six lines, the very top line, the one on the top, is going to be your first string on the guitar. Coming down from there, then the second line is going to be the second string and onwards all the way down to the lowest string, the sixth string, which is on the bottom on the tab. And a helpful way to remember this is that if you were to look at your guitar as you hold it, the way you would see it is that the, the, the highest string or the top string is on the top. And then as you're looking down here, the bottom string is on the bottom and the tab is written the same way. So it's the same view that you have when you look downwards at your instrument. On each line of the tab, numbers show you which fret to play on each individual string of the guitar. So for example, if we look at a tab and on the first line, on the top line, we've got the number three, it means that at that point you should play the third fret on the first string and make that note. Similarly, if we looked at a tab and we had the eighth fret on the second string, it would mean that we go to fret number eight and we play that. If the number zero is written on a particular string, for example, the fourth line down, that would be your fourth string on the guitar, the number zero represents an open string. So it would mean that we would play this. That's generally for single notes. To display chords in a tab, we stack up the numbers of the frets that we need to play vertically on top of each other. So for example, a standard G chord, like this, from top to bottom on a tab, you would have three, zero, 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 two, three. And that represents fret number three, open string, open string, open string, fret number two, fret number three. We always read tabs left to right, and the notes are in the order that we need to play them in. In the majority of tabs that I've seen, you'll usually have an accompanying stave as well. And that stave will usually give you things like a tempo marker, it'll give you a key signature, um, it might give you things like a time signature as well, but sometimes you'll come across um, a tab with no stave and you might not actually get that information. So what do you need to actually know to be able to read and use a tab? Well, the good news is that you don't need any special information. As I've said up to now, the top line of the tab represents the top string on your fretted string instrument. The notes are always written in chronological order, so in other words, the order that we play them in. We always read it left to right. That's all the basic info. But going on from there, there are a couple of symbols that we need to learn uh, to understand what they represent on a tab as well. You'll also often find at tabs that there are accompanying chord charts that appear above the tab 
on certain tabs, not all of them, but sometimes you will come across these chord charts. It's not always immediately obvious from a tab what musical changes are happening in a, um, in, in a particular section of a song if you're reading it just from the tab alone. So the chord changes really give you a better idea of musically of what's going on. So these chord charts are usually written vertically and it'll give you an idea of the fingering that you use to make that chord. And looking at the chord chart straight on, it's helpful to think of it as the view you get when you look directly at, at your fretboard. So for me, it's holding the guitar and looking directly at it. That's usually the way the chord is written in above the tab. The first box of the chord chart will be the entire first fret of the guitar. And you'll see the six strings in the guitar's case. Um, or for your own instrument, it might be four, five, six, seven strings, whatever it is. Um, so the first box you see would be the first fret, the second box will be the second fret, and so on from there. Sometimes also you'll see chord charts that have a little number beside them. For example, if you had a chord chart with the number seven written beside it, that means start the shape from the seventh fret. The numbers on these chord charts refer to the finger that you use to make the chord shape in question. And as a quick crash course, your index finger is number one, your middle finger is number two, your ring finger is number three, and your pinky is number four. And even though I haven't seen it before, I sometimes put in T for thumb as well, because a lot of the chords that I make in my um, songs and tunes, I end up using my thumb in them as well. So sometimes you'll also see T written in there as well. So as an example, here's the chord of E minor, a basic E minor chord. It's got open strings on the sixth string, the third string, the second string, and the first string. And it's got two fretted notes. They're both on the second fret on strings number five and number four. Sometimes you'll also see a bar that goes across multiple strings. So for example, the chord of F sharp major has a bar going across the entire second fret. And it's also got um, some fretted notes beyond that. It's also got two fretted notes on the fourth fret on strings five and four. And you've also got a fretted note on the third string on fret number three as well. So we are fretting on each string, but the bar chord is what's important here. Um, the bar along the second fret to create that F sharp major chord. And just so we don't get confused, I would think of these chord charts more like photographs and to think of the tab as a map. The chord charts only really give you information about the chord that's being played, whereas the tab gives you the melodies, the, the kind of the single lines, the arpeggios, some of the bass runs, to the more intricate info, and it happens over time. Whereas a chord chart is just, it's kind of like taking a photograph of somebody playing the guitar and the shape they're playing at that moment. They're also really handy if you're giving um, you know, music to another musician. They may not be able to read the tab, but they should be able to follow along if there are chord charts written in on top of the, tar of the tab as well. If you've got to this point in the video, I want to know what you think about tabs. So I want you to go into the comment section and write, here's what I think about tabs, and let me know your opinions on using tabs. Are they good? Are they bad? Do you find them useful or not? Have you ever even heard of tabs before? Whatever it is, I want to hear your opinion on it in the comment section. Now let's talk about some of the symbols that we need to know. So while tab gives you information about which string to play, which fret to press down, and when to play the note, we need some symbols to really get across more information about the dynamics of a piece of music. The most common symbol you'll see written in guitar tablature is probably PM, which stands for palm muting. If PM, and sometimes a series of lines, is written above a section of music in a tab, it means that you should play that section using palm muting. So palm muting, if you're unfamiliar, means to get this part, the fleshy part of your palm, to put it along the, the bridge down at the saddle, and to mute the string as it's being played. For example, here's a short phrase that I'll play without palm muting and then with palm muting. Sometimes on a tab we'll see the letter X written and this generally means a muted note. So a muted note is a note that doesn't ring out. It doesn't really make any sound. Um, in isolation, it sounds like this. 
So that doesn't really sound like much. But to give it more context, um, in the example you'll see a B minor 7 chord that I play here. But what I do is, even though I'm fretting the middle four strings, there's no noise coming out of the first string or the sixth string, even though I'm strumming them when I play. And you hear there the sixth string, no noise, first string, no noise. And I'm catching them with the kind of the outer parts of my fingers. I'm muting those notes intentionally. So that, that's what the X represents on a tab. And bear in mind, these notes can sometimes be included for percussive effect. If you're familiar with my tune Avenue, there are an awful lot of X's written in on that tab to signify all the percussive ghost notes that I play in that groove. Another really common instruction is let ring, which is fairly self-explanatory. It means that any note that you play, you should let it ring, you should let it sustain as long as possible. For example, uh, the phrase I'm going to play now won't be sustained, I'm going to mute every note. When I let them all ring out, it sounds like this. It's also really common to, to see this written at the beginning of a piece of music. If it needs to be sustained throughout the whole piece, you'll see let ring throughout written at the beginning of the tab. So when we want to notate bending strings on a tablature, we employ the use of arrows. Now there are lots of different ways to bend a string and it's more common to find this on guitar tabs because generally the strings are looser. You don't really find this on mandolin tabs or banjo tabs, tenor banjo tabs, a huge amount, but you do find them particularly on electric guitar tabs an awful lot. And depending on the shape of the arrow and the number that goes along with the arrow, it gives us different information as to how to bend a string and whether or not we let it go and up to what pitch, etc, etc. So the most common one you'll come across is probably a half step bend. That's where you start on a note, let's say the tab has number 7 written on the second string, that will be the 7th fret, the F sharp note. You'll have an arrow that starts uh, kind of uh, going towards the right and also going upwards. And depending on the number written above it, it tells you how much to bend. So for example, if you have the number 7 and then the arrow goes up and it says 1 over 2 or 1 half, it means that you should bend up a half step. In other words, you want to bend from F sharp up to G. So the instruction tells us to play this. Like that. We've bent the string from F sharp up a half step to G. Like that. If the instruction tells us uh, to bend up a full step, it'll have the same arrow curving upwards, but it might have the number 1 and it might also say full step. So for example, if it gave us the number 12 on the second string, that would be B. And if it said full step, we would need to bend not to C, but to C sharp. That's a full step. A half step would be to C, a full step from there is C sharp. So the instruction tells us to play this. That's a full step bend. Building on that, you might also come across a curved arrow pointing up to a number or a fraction and then bending back down. So an arrow coming down in the other direction back to where it started. This tells us that we should bend up to a note and then bend back down. For example, if we use the same two notes again and the same two intervals, if we were to start on the seventh fret on the second string on the tab, the number seven would be on the second line down. The arrow up tells us to bend up from F sharp to G, but unlike the first time, it's also telling us now to bend back down to F sharp in the same movement. So the instruction gives us this. Similarly, if we see the arrow uh, going from fret number 12 up a full step, then back down, that's the instruction that we were given there. From number 12 up to essentially a C sharp, so we bend up and then bend back down. It's a difficult bend to do on an acoustic. You'll also see pre-bends notated with an arrow going directly upwards. So a pre-bend is where we bend the string out of tune before we strike the note. For example, if we were up here on the 15th fret on the second string, 
and we were to pre-bend, it means that we don't start with this note. We bend it first as, by the amount given by the tab, in this case a half, and then bend it back into tune, into where it should be. So it starts here, bend, play the note, and then back down. Like that. Same thing on the 11th fret, uh, we would start on the 11th fret by fretting it, bend it first, play the G note, and then come back down into F sharp. That's a pre-bend. If you're enjoying this video and you want to see more videos like this one, take a look at the Fretboard Atlas, my teaching platform on truefire.com. Over on the Fretboard Atlas, I have over 600 video lessons covering lots of different topics, all relating to music, guitar playing, and an awful lot more. I interview some of my favorite musicians there. We look in depth at my own original compositions. I have a whole section dedicated to Irish traditional music, and there are regular uploads every single Friday on the channel. If you think it's for you, head over to the Fretboard Atlas on truefire.com. Sliding from one note to another is also a really common thing to do on stringed instruments. And we notate this on a tab, usually by using an angled line that stretches from one note to the target note. So if we're sliding from a lower pitched note to a higher pitched note, the line that connects the two numbers on a tab will start from the bottom left corner and it will go up to the top right corner. So it'll start beneath, for example, number five on the kind of the lower end of the number five, and it will stretch up to the top of the number nine that we want it to land on. Uh, this sounds like this. And then if we're sliding the opposite direction, the line will start at the top of the first number and go down towards it, the target note. And this mimics the way it would be written on a stave, on a, uh, um, a regular, kind of classical music stave, if you want to call it that. It mimics the direction that the pitch is going in. So that sounds like this. And it doesn't really matter what the interval is. It doesn't matter if you're going down one fret or if you're going down all the frets. The line uh, always reflects the change in pitch. If you're going downwards, the line will start high and go down. If you're going upwards, the line will start low and go high. You can also sometimes find an arc written over the slide on the tab, and this tells you that the slide should be a legato slide. So the difference between what we did before and what we're going to do now is that before we would essentially pick both of the notes and slide in between. This time we're going to use the energy from picking that first note and sustain it up into the next note. So you see, I'm only doing one movement with my hand there. That's a legato slide. Doing it in the opposite direction then. Like that. And again, the way this is notated on the tab is by putting an arc over the, um, the angled line that joins these two notes. Sometimes we also need to notate slide ins and slide outs. A slide in is where we have a very defined target note, but our starting point is a little less certain. So for example, if we were going to slide in to fret number nine on the second string, a slide in from below means it's coming from below the string up to that fret, below the fret on that string, and it's coming upwards, up the neck into it. Um, a slide in would sound like this. And there's no real defined starting point there. You could be sliding in from the first fret, you could be sliding in from the middle of the neck. That doesn't really matter. The more important um, facet of that is landing on the note correctly. And to notate that, we do the same thing um, as the slide before in tab, but the angled line is a lot shorter and it doesn't have a starting number. So for example, the angled line going upwards into the nine sounds like that. The opposite of this is sliding in from above, in other words, descending in pitch, coming down to the ninth fret. And in this case, the angle would line, the, the angle of the line would be downwards instead of upwards. So it would sound like this. Oh, that's the seventh fret, it'd actually sound like this. So that's a slide in from above, slide in from below. And again, the starting point there is a little bit undefined. 
A slide out then is the opposite, where the starting point is very definite, but the finish is less definite. So in this case, we start on the ninth fret, and if we're sliding out downwards, it sounds like this. Sliding out upwards sounds like this. And again, we don't have a defined ending point there. It's whenever we take our finger off the string. Downwards, upwards. Now let's talk about hammer-ons and pull-offs. Hammering on is a technique where we strike a note and then we use the force of our left hand fretting the new note to essentially create all of the sound of that note. Sounds a little bit technical, 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 but in actuality it's a really, really common thing that guitar players do. For example, um, this is a series of hammer-ons. So musically there we have eight notes, we're only striking the strings four times in total. What's happening is we're playing a note using the force of the finger, uh, like this, to get the note. Same thing again, hammering on to the next fret, hammering on, hammering on. So that is very much a, a um, fretting hand movement that we're doing there to get the note. To notate this in a tab, what we do is we draw an arc between the starting note and the note that is to be hammered on. So for example, if we had a zero on the second string and then we were going to hammer on to the third fret, we would have zero and an arc leading on to the three. That tells us to hammer on to the third fret. Then again, three up to five. Then again, we move on to the first string, open hammer on, then the three, arc onto the five, and that's how you notate a hammer on in tablature. The exact opposite of this is called a pull off, where instead of going upwards in pitch, we're now going to go downwards in pitch. So if I play that phrase starting from the high note instead, we're going to start on the fifth fret on the first string, and we're going to use the force of our finger here to create the next note, which is going to be on the third fret. So I'm fretting this third fret already in anticipation of the note. I play the fifth string and I use this finger to pull it off to create the next note, which is going to be the third fret below it. Do it again, three down to zero. Move on to the second string, five down to three. And then three down to zero. And that's a pull-off on the guitar. To notate this in tablature, we do the same thing as the hammer-on. We put an arc between the starting note and the target note. And for a pull-off, instead of writing H for hammer-on, we write P for pull-off. Similar to bending, vibrato is a really common technique that we use on fretted string instruments. And if we want to notate that on a tablature, what we do is the note or the section that needs to be played with vibrato will have a little wavy, a little squiggly line written over um, the tablature at the part where it needs to be played with vibrato. So for example, if we had a section uh, that had four notes in it, G, A, B, D, frets number eight, 10, 12, and 10 again on the um, highest string, and only the third note needed vibrato, we would have eight, 10, then 12, and above that 12 on the tab, a squiggly line. You'd have a vibrato. Now, it doesn't tell you what type of vibrato, that's a different thing altogether. And then finally, um, the, the last note with no vibrato. That's how we would notate it. So once we get to that number 12, we could have a vibrato that's like this, or a vibrato that's like this. It's similar to bending in that we are technically bending the string a little bit out of tune or, or away from its original pitch, uh, but it's a lot more subtle than bending. We're not bending up to a different pitch, we're staying in or around that kind of home base. Tapping is something that we come across in tabs an awful lot as well, particularly in the fingerstyle guitar world. Um, there are two different kinds um, and they involve two different hands. So for left hand tapping, uh, in my case, I should more correctly say fretting hand tapping. Um, these are kind of generally known as hammer-ons from nowhere. And if you remember from when we just spoke about hammer-ons a few minutes ago, uh, we make a note and then we use the force of, of uh, the finger 
to create the next note. This is the same idea except for we have no starting note, so we're hammering on out of completely nowhere. So if I play a four note uh, pattern, let's pick this, okay, G, A, B, D again. If I hammer on uh, from nowhere for all of these notes, it sounds like this, purely a, a fretting hand exercise. Okay, not a huge amount of volume created there, but that is um, the, the technique. To notate this on a tab, we would have a little arc starting before the note that we want to land on, but you'll notice that it doesn't have a number at the beginning of the arc because there is nothing to be played. So that tells us that the arc means we're going to hammer on, but we're not starting anywhere to achieve that hammer on. We're depending purely on the force of our hand to get it like that. So that's fretting hand tapping. We've also got picking hand tapping. So that means coming uh, up onto the fretboard with your picking hand, in this case my right hand, and playing the same notes but we're going to get them instead with the force of the picking hand. Like that. I'm also actually muting the strings here as well. That doesn't have to be done do it that way as well. To notate this on a tab, what you'll usually see is the letter T written above the note that needs to be played. Um, and that's usually it. So, so when you see the letter T for tapping, it means you're using your picking hand. If you see it, the hammer on from nowhere, it means that you're using your fretting hand. But it's the same movement by both hands. You are kind of tapping the note without any starting point beforehand. On some tabs, particularly on bass tabs, you'll find notes with the letters S or P written above them, and this refers to slapping and popping. So if you're going to slap a note, it means that you get the note, you strike the note with your thumb on your uh, picking hand, and you kind of bounce off, it's like nearly a basketball style motion, where uh, instead of leaving your thumb on the string, you bounce off it. That's slapping the string, and it gives you this kind of thud uh, sound underneath the um, the note that sounded as well. Um, you've also got popping, which is kind of the opposite, where you get your fingers underneath a note and pull it outwards from the guitar, like that. And that causes the string to, to essentially, um, the, the force of it slaps back against the, the fretboard of the guitar, and it creates this popping sound. So there's a slap. And there's a pop like that. To notate these on a tab, um, as I said, we put the letters S or P above the notes in question. So uh, the example that we have written out in the tab sounds like this. Two, three, four. So really important for most fretted string instruments is knowing when to use upstrokes and downstrokes. And if we want to symbolize these on a tab, we've got two symbols, one for upstrokes, one for downstrokes. So we know that if a particular note needs to be played in a particular way, we're able to note that on the tab. The symbol for a downstrokes looks, I always think it looks a little bit like a table. It's a thick line and it's got two legs coming down on either side. And then the symbol for an upstroke looks like a big letter V, and that indicates that you should play an upstroke for that note on the tab. In the example, you'll see that each note written has a downstroke or an upstroke, and that's a guide as to how you should play it. So the example sounds like this. has a very specific way of being played, be it a downstroke or an upstroke. And these symbols can also be used for strumming. So for example, if we have a passage that sounds like this. The symbols above each chord tells us 
um, or the cymbals tell us which way we should be strumming for that particular chord. We can play harmonics on all string instruments by touching the string at certain intervals in order to take advantage of essentially eliminating the, uh, the fundamental frequency um, and hearing only the overtones. Um, of a particular string. Depending on where we touch the string we get or we hear a different pitch coming from that string. And there are lots of different ways that these are used uh, but generally they're broken down into what I would call natural harmonics and artificial harmonics. And these are notated slightly differently on a tablature depending on how we uh, actually create the harmonic sound in the first place. So if we're playing natural harmonics, uh, which I would understand to mean notes that don't require any fretting, or harmonics that don't require any fretting um, to achieve. Uh, in other words, uh, like the 12th fret, the 7th fret, 5th fret, and to kind of the, the other couple of areas that we can get them on the guitar. Um, I would think of those as natural harmonics, and we notate those by putting uh, the number on the tab inside of two chevrons, or essentially kind of inside a little diamond, or two kind of most of a triangle on either side, little arrows on each side of a note. And sometimes instead of these arrows or chevrons, you'll also get a little dot uh, written beside the note as well. So for example, you could have on the 12th fret, instead of the chevrons on either side, you could also have dots beside all of these notes. So the example sounds like this. So then in the case of artificial harmonics, which are harmonics that require fretting to achieve, uh, we need a little bit more information on the tab. What we usually have is the number of the fret that we have to hold, and also the number of the fret where we're achieving the harmonic we're looking for as well. So for example, if I were to hold a regular G chord, okay, this is a, well, it's a G bar chord, or if you follow the caged plus system, it's G is an E shape. What I would write on the tab is each of these notes, or each of these frets rather, you'd have three, five, five, four, three, and three. And then I would also have the number of the fret at which we play the harmonic. So if we're going 12 frets up from the third fret, we end up on fret number 15. So we'd have the number three, and then in chevrons beside it, we'd also have the number 15. And that would give us this sound. And if I went through each string of the chord, it would sound like this. So that's where we have 3 and 15, 5 and 17, 5 and 17, 4 and 16, 3 and 15, and 3 and 15. Because those require fretting, so that's how we notate what to play with the left hand and also play what to play with the right hand as well. So now that we've discussed the chord charts and all the various symbols you can find on the tab, let's also talk a little bit about the limitations of tab as well. The main issue I think with tabs is that they don't give you any indication of rhythm whatsoever. You really need to know a piece of music or know how it goes or know what to expect from a tab to be able to use it properly. Now you can be saved from this if there's an accompanying score with the tab that has uh, rhythm values uh, for each note to show you how long you can expect to hold it or play it. But if you're working from a tab alone and you don't know how the song goes or the piece of music, whatever it might be, you won't be able to actually get any rhythmic information from it because it only tells you what fret to play but it doesn't tell you how long to hold it for or in some cases how it should be struck and can get the kind of the finer dynamic points. It Tab has progressed an awful lot and there there is a lot you can do now um, that maybe you weren't able to do before with tabs. Uh, but you still have that drawback of needing to understand the rhythm of a piece of music and, and the kind of how it goes overall, the structure of the song, um, and how long to hold each note for. Otherwise, if you don't have that information, a tab can be fairly useless to you. Another limit of tab, or kind of a limitation, is that a tab doesn't transfer easily to other instruments or other musicians. If you have a tab that's written for a six-string acoustic guitar in standard tuning, and you give that even to another guitar player who's in a different tuning, 
it won't make any sense to them. If you gave it to a pianist or a drummer or something like that, it would be of no use whatsoever to them at all. Whereas a score is transferable. If you write out a score for a piece of music and you're able to read music, it doesn't matter what instrument you play, you're able to follow it and you know exactly what's going on. Tab doesn't have that advantage, unfortunately. It's a non-transferable means of notation. And the most important thing of all, I think, is that using tablature starting off on your guitar journey can be great for picking up um, you know, tunes and songs that you want to learn but it, they do absolutely nothing to improve your ear skills, which are definitely the most important thing you need to learn as a musician of any kind. You need to be able to train your ear and learn how to use it and to be able to depend on it. Tabs are useful as a practical and mechanical way of learning where to place your fingers on the fretboard of your instrument or on the fingerboard, but it's important not to fall into the trap of depending on these shapes to form your understanding of music and the understanding you have of your own instrument. I think it's really important to take a deeper look at what you're playing once you've learned how to play it. In other words, there's absolutely nothing wrong with getting a tab, following along and learning a piece of music, but I think it's also important then once you've learned it to go back and really analyze it, to really take a look at, okay, I've learned how to play this particular passage, but let me try and find out what chord is actually going on here. Can I identify what this is built from? For example, if I'm playing an arpeggio like this, can I then go back and look at the notes that I'm playing and recognize this as the middle of a G chord? Because if I can make that connection, it means that I'm actually deepening my understanding of what's going on musically, rather than just thinking frets number five, five, four, three, five, three, you know, that kind of thing. It's important not to fall into that trap. And you can do this with any tab that you've learned from, maybe try and take a look at the chord changes, look at the notes you're playing and see if they're chord tones or not, take a look at what's happening in the bass, try and relate it back to kind of the fundamental structure of the song. It's not an easy thing to do starting off, but it does solidify your understanding of what's actually happening on the fingerboard of your instrument. I hope you found this overview of tabs really useful. If you want to take a look at any of my tabs on my online store, go to shanehennessy.ie and you'll find all the tabs that I have written for my own original pieces there. I've put a huge amount of work into making sure the tabs are as accurate as possible and so if you get them you can be confident that you're playing the same version that I am playing on any of my CDs.